I didn't even think this was a PC at first. I thought it was a coaster until I realized it was connected to a monitor. Inside this tiny puck is Qualcomm's brand new Snapdragon X2 Elite. And I've been using this, the X Elite Dev Kit, for over a year now. This one's got the most powerful first gen Snapdragon X Elite chip in it. And in my developer test, it held up surprisingly well. Geekbench 2800 single core, around 15,000 multi core for a 12 core compute chip. That's legit. But here's the thing that little coaster I just showed you, it's packing Qualcomm's second second generation ship. They're back. And it just walked into the room, set its scores on the table, and politely asked the X1 to step aside. We finally have real benchmarks for the X2 Elite and the X2 Elite Extreme. And unlike last time where Qualcomm handed us numbers and said, trust us, this time they did something different. They flew me out to San Diego and said, run the benchmarks yourself as many times as you want. So let's talk about what I found. First, let's make sure we're all on the same page. You'll hear me say SOC uh, a lot in this video. SOCs is the way all mobile manufacturers are starting to go now. It's the CPU, the GPU, and the NPU memory controller all on one piece of silicon. And that's good for a lot of things, battery life, thermals, and performance. So when I say Snapdragon X2, I'm not just talking about the processor, I'm talking about the whole brain of the laptop, all crammed into a chip smaller than a postage stamp. Well, if it was a really big postage stamp. Actually, that is pretty tiny. That part right there is the CPU GPU, and these three little chunks are the memory. Now, when a company invites you to their headquarters to run the benchmarks yourself, that's either supreme confidence or a really elaborate trap. Qualcomm gave me a full architectural deep dive and a lab tour. And I'll be honest, parts of it went a little bit over my head, or maybe a lot over my head. They redesigned a lot with this generation, but the lab tour, that was the fun part for me. Really educational and gave me a chance to run some benchmarks myself, no restrictions, as many times as I wanted to. Of course, software development Developer specific tests will require software installations and all that. That'll come later on in the channel. And my main interest is developer performance and local AI capability because if these ships can run large language models locally without burning a hole in your electricity bill or pinging a server farm, that changes a lot of things. And spoiler, they weren't bluffing. The numbers held up, but the why behind the numbers is where it gets interesting. So what actually changed under the hood? Because new chip doesn't always mean better chip. Well, first of all, they moved from a four nanometer process to three nanometers. That alone means more transistors in less space, which usually means better efficiency. But here's the bigger deal. The X Elite, or now it's known as the X1, it had 12 identical cores. With the X2, they split things up into prime cores and performance cores. Here's the prime cores and here's the performance cluster. Six performance cores per cluster. Look at all these acronyms. <laughs> IFU? <laughs> no thanks. I mean, sure. It's probably good, right? Prime cores, here we go. Think of these as the heavy hitters. These are for demanding tasks. And the performance cores handle your everyday stuff more efficiently. So now the whole architecture is also scalable. They can make this same design smaller for phones or bigger for servers. Now I'm not sure what's gonna go into their new AI 200s and 250s that are server grade machines that are gonna be going into data centers next year, but perhaps some of these architecture actually trickled up or down from that idea. That's just speculation on my part. But we do need to keep track track of the server stuff because that's going to be where things end up, where your models are going to end up running if you develop them locally on laptops or dev boxes, whatever is going to be available and carry the Snapdragon X2s in the next year or so. Now, initially, we're going to see only three of these variants. These are the SKUs or part numbers, the X2 Elite and the X2 Elite Extreme. Notice these two are a little bit different because one is a 12 core and one is an 18 core. We're jumping up by six cores from the last generation. Notice that the Snapdragon X2 Elite Extreme can boost up to 5 gigahertz now. And there's something else down here for us people that really like RAM. This Extreme one can handle more than 128 gigs of memory. More on that in a minute. Also, I wanted to show you this performance chart. This is comparing the X2 Elite Extreme with the Snapdragon X Elite. Big difference in performance. And yeah, it's one of those charts that's just hanging out there, but they actually put some numbers on this one this time. 39%, 43% over here in efficiency, and some numbers down here. Idle normalized platform power. And this is while running Geekbench single core. The GPU, it's called the Adreno GPU, and it also got a little bit of a boost. Now this is not a gaming channel, but some people game, 
Developers Game 2, here's some gaming results compared with the Snapdragon X Elite. You can see the big difference from X Elite, which is in gray, and then the X2 Elite, which is in red, dark red, and then the X2 Elite Extreme is just way up there. More frame rates. This one compares them to the Intel Core Ultra Series 2, 50% faster and 29% faster versus the AMD Ryzen AI 9. And I'm sure gaming channels are gonna dig into this and try this out themselves once the machines come out. I'll be doing more or developer tests and AI tests. Here's some performance comparisons with the GPU. Now the big architectural upgrade is now the GPU is slice based. So it's got four identical slices per GPU. You need more power, you add slices. You need less, you remove slices. And each slice has one terabyte per second of memory bandwidth. Relax, inside the GPU, okay? in the GPU. So if you got four slices, that's four terabytes per second of total throughput on the GPU alone. Basically, Qualcomm built themselves a set of Lego bricks. Same pieces, different configurations. Phones, laptops, servers, one architecture to rule them all. So at this point in the uh, architecture deep dive, my eyes kind of started to glaze over. And then they started talking about AI. Obviously, the focus here is going to be big on the NPU side, but they're considering the highly multidimensional landscape of uh, all the different models and technologies and stacks for AI that are available out there. McAfee? Why is McAfee on there? I don't know, but you know, maybe they're doing AI too now. With AI, there's the hardware part, but there's also the software part. And Let's be honest, with the X Elite, the software part was a little bit on the weaker side. So Qualcomm is trying to turn this around. They are partnering with all these different software vendors to really start taking advantage of the hardware that's available. So if you're curious, here's a list of all the applications enabled on Snapdragon X series. There's a lot. And then they hit me with the FP8, BF16, 2-bit weights, all native, and native Vulkan support, all baked in. They're not messing around with AI. Well, you really can't these days. So this chip is really designed to run models efficiently, not as an afterthought, not through software hacks, natively. In the lab, they showed off some impressively fast text generation powered by the Hexagon MPU. Oh yeah, if I didn't explain that, Orion is the CPU cores, Adreno is the GPU, and Hexagon is the NPU. They're just code names. They're running any Thing of the lamb and the speed was pretty good. I'll be testing this myself once I get my hands on retail units, so stay tuned for that. Here's why this matters beyond just the cool demo. The shift to NPU-based AI is gonna save data centers so much money. Less power, less heat, less infrastructure. Like I mentioned, Qualcomm's got their AI 200 chips coming for enterprise in 2026, but this is where it all starts. No OEMs announced any pricing yet or even any devices yet. Hopefully that's coming at CES and I'll be over there to check that out firsthand. But I do hope they take advantage of this 128 plus gigabytes for the X2 Elite Extreme capability. And each one of these goes up to 128, which is really freaking cool. Do you know who else pulled off more than 128 gigabytes in an SOC? Apple. That's it. That's the list. Why does this matter? Because if you want to run large language models locally, like actually large ones, you need memory. Lots of it. And now you'll be able to cram that into a device the size of a coaster. Oh, uh, and it's got 12 PCIe Gen 5 lanes. Which means, theoretically, you could hook up an external GPU. That's a discrete GPU, maybe one of these. If an OEM has the courage to expose it. I want to see something like this B-Link GTI 15. This one has an exposed PCIe slot that's full size. And I love to see something like that with an X2 Elite Extreme inside. That would be... Mwah. Chef's kiss. Oh, a fun little footnote here. 152 gigabytes per second is the memory bandwidth on the X2 Elite, which is just a little bit higher than Apple's M5 by uh, about two gigabytes per second. Is that a massive difference? <laughs> no, but they just had to do it to say that they have more. Of course, the extreme version has even more than that, 228 gigabytes per second. Big memory, fast lanes, room for expansion. This isn't just a mobile chip pretending to be powerful. It's a genuinely capable platform. Now, here's the part where I have have to pump the brakes a little because the devices I tested in San Diego, well, they're not actual laptops you're going to buy. Qualcomm uses something called CRDs or Compute Reference Design. They're in-house reference laptops and boards that OEMs and devs use as the golden sample. They use it to validate drivers, thermals, and performance before retail designs exist. Here's a reference drivers repository where they keep their drivers. Think of CRDs as the ideal. It's got perfect thermals, 
perfect tuning, no compromises for battery life or thin bezels. They're what the chip can do under perfect conditions. Although in their lab tests, they vary the conditions so they can really test a big range of things. But they do it using these CRDs. And you've probably seen these CRDs for the X Elite. They were like the original Terminator movie. And now they've got the red ones for the X2 Elite, which are a little bit bigger, plus the sleek black X2 Elite Extreme CRDs. Same core idea, but cranked up with way more polish and firepower. So, T2, Terminator 2, way cooler than Terminator 1, who agrees? But what happens when OEMs build real laptops with trade-offs for weight, fan, noise, and price? Here's an example of Qualcomm CRD from the last generation, Snapdragon X Elite. You always have to look to make sure that we're looking at the same SKU X1E 84 100. X of course means Snapdragon X. One is the generation, so X1. E is elite. 84 is the, the level. And 100 is kind of reserved for later. So we've got 2,944 and 15,422. This is one of the top SKUs for the Qualcomm Orion CPU that was available for OEMs. And Samsung took that chip. There it is, X1E84100. Here's the Geekbench scores for the Samsung Galaxy Book 4 Edge. This was the one with the highest SKU from the previous generation. And look at this score, 2,822 single core and 13,826 multi-core. Huh? We have a bit of a drop there, don't we? From the CRDs, which are in a perfect situation to the actual device that may have other stuff installed on Windows. Who knows what's happening over there? But basically, we have a little bit of a loss. It's not a perfect one to one. That's the reality tax. By the way, here's a lower skew of a real device. This is the Lenovo 4810. Well, you get the idea, whatever that model is. So quite a bit lower single core score because it's a lower SKU of the X1. Now for the X2, this is the lower end one with 12 cores. Look at that score, 3,850 for single core and 16,171 for multi-core. And that's the lower end one. MacBook Air M4 is about the same with the single core and lower with the multi-core. Here's the 18 core version of the X2 Elite. Single core about the same. Multi-core, we're over 20,000 now. We're getting close. The MacBook Pro M4 Pro has pretty much the same single core score and the multi-core score is just a little bit bigger, but here's the extreme version. 4,072 is what I got in Geekbench for the X2 Elite Extreme for single core and 23,611 for the multi-core score. We've blown way past the M4 Pro chip and we're approaching the M4 Max. Actually, it beat the M4 Max in the single core score, and this is only Qualcomm's second generation attempt. This is why I'm really excited about this thing. We're talking about a lot of power and efficiency. Now, if I were to make any guesses about what, uh, I don't know, something like a new Samsung Galaxy Book 5 or whatever might happen, I don't know anything about this, but I'm just guessing. Then estimated real world numbers might be just a little bit lower than that. So we're looking at maybe 3,900 for single core and around 21, 22,000 for multi-core. We'll find out for sure when devices start launching, probably a little bit after CES in January. I'll be there at CES to check them out and get my hands on them as soon as they're available. So the X2 generation looks like a genuine leap, not just incremental, but since they changed the architecture quite a bit, it's got better efficiency, scalable architecture, serious AI chops, and some serious memory headroom. Now, when they say 128 plus, what is that, 256, 512, I don't know, but we'll find out. And also, it doesn't mean that OEMs will make machines that have more than 128 gigabytes, especially now. But if you're a developer, this is worth paying attention to. If you're just somebody who wants a laptop that doesn't sound like a jet engine while running local AI, same. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss my reviews of the upcoming units. And I did spend a bunch of time with the first generation with the X Elites, using them on my developer workflows. I did a couple of videos on that, so check that out right over here and right over here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.